to appear and, and uh, I did my undergrad from Turkey and then I worked uh, at Adobe in Noida for a like three, four years. Then I and went to my master's and So I continued for a PhD and uh, it's like still a couple of years more for me to finish. And uh, I, I was just like uh, traveling to India and I happened to sort of know that there's a connection between Amitabh and Chen Li there who happens to be a principal investigator of, of this project, Aspects. So it's a setup and uh, that brings me here. So with that, I'll just uh, begin the talk. So uh, I'll give you an overview. So I'm going to present you an analysis challenge. I'm going to talk about a system that we call Asterix. And uh, primarily, I'm going to focus on three features of the system. Uh, the first is data ingestion or data feeds. Uh, okay. So let me uh, set the theme here. So, so you all know that US is uh, going to have presidential elections and there's going to be a lot of buzz around it. Whether it be social media, like it means different things to different people. Uh, to the people who are contesting it, people who are covering it. But what does it mean to a data scientist like you and me? So basically it means a challenge. Now why is it a challenge, uh, the election? The thing is that there's a massive amount of data that's going to be generated around this event, right? They could, there's going to be blogs, news articles, and people writing a lot of stuff about it. and so. We have a scale problem from that angle. We also have a problem that data is not structured because data must, is likely to be on web. That is semi or unstructured data. So you have a model. Of course, like there's no one place that you can just go and get all the data that you need to gather information and uh, analyze it. So there are multiple sources. Like there are blog sites, sites there are news sites. So this there's a problem of information integration here, right? And then of course like. Data has text to it for analytics and also has spatial component as to where the thing is originating from. So you need to actually consider both the dimensions and see how you can make most of the data. So since it's election time, I would say that you should vote for aspects. And uh, I'll explain now what the system does. So what's the aspects approach? So uh, I'll take you back to uh, some history here. So basically, Semi-structured data management is not something new here. Right? So it has been existing for quite a decade now. Uh, we had XML. We had a language that could process XML. Answer queries over XML data, that's X query. We had JSON model. We have other data models as well. So there has been a uh, parallel effort for parallelizing all this XML processing. And we are in the, when we're doing XML, we are semi-structured. Right? On a on other front, we have parallel database systems, completely structured, and there the research has been going for like last two, 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 three decades, right? So where we reached was that we went from a single database system to a parallel database system, and we did all the query optimization and everything. And then someday Rakesh Agarwal said that diapers and baby oils are being sold together, so let's do some data mining here. So we sort of uh, the research, I would say, did not go beyond a certain point and debated and went to data mining, right? And then what has happened in recent, uh, like last decade is, we've got this data intensive computer that's coming up. Uh, if you, are you familiar with MapReduce and Hadoop, right? So these are like uh, uh, programming models and infrastructures that have been developed in last decade and primarily uh, endorsed by Google. So basically there's a lot of language effort here. Like we had, had SQL here in databases. That now we are coming up with different languages. We are having Pig, Hive, Jackal, and something like that. And we are also like so. Basically, a question to answer here is that now we have got three different sort of communities who have spent some effort in this direction. What if they were they could actually learn from lessons learned from each other? Okay. So the ASICS approach is that we're going to take semi-structured data management. We have parallel database systems and we have data intensive computer. Okay? Now, how can we combine all of this, whatever we have learned so far, last two decades, 
what's and particularly what we are coming up with last second and right now, how can we combine everything and build one system that allows you to process data that is semi-structured, unstructured, or fully structured? Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, the demerits of MapReduce as well. Uh, basically, like, there's a lot of papers around comparing these two approaches, like the MapReduce and a pure database approach. And uh, I'm going to go into details later. For now, let me move forward. So let me uh, explain you what the architecture looks like. So basically, it's a shared nothing architecture, which basically means you have a cluster of nodes, and each node has its own CPU and memory and disk. Okay, uh, nothing shared except they can communicate uh, using the network. So I've got a node here. I have an aspects client interface. Okay, I have a language compiler uh, and a catalog. We have a data flow engine. We have a storage layer. And then finally, the index layer, which is the LSM log such a uh, merge tree uh, structure. So if you look at the database stack, you have a language, you have a compiler that compiles and builds a logical plan, optimizes and builds a physical, physical plan, and handles it into to an execution engine that runs it on a cluster. Right? Now what you're seeing here is a textbook sort of architecture as to how you would build a parallel database system. And this is exactly that. But the difference is that. Each of this was built from scratch. It's a new language, so we wrote a compiler for it. This data flow engine is basically, uh, you guys have heard of Dryad. Uh, Dryad is a, a data flow engine from Microsoft, which basically takes a graph from you. Graph has nodes and uh, edges connecting it. So a node is an operation. An edge represents flow of data from one node to other. So it's basically flow of data between nodes, and each node does something to the Data is more, more like functional programming. Okay? So given a DAG to you, you have to execute it on a cluster. Okay? And feel free to interrupt me and I can go into details here. So the data flow engine is the entity that takes a DAG okay, and says that okay, this is where this is what I need to execute and I have the resources with me. But just the layer above it is responsible for passing what you wrote and Forming that DAG. Okay? Yeah. So let me, uh, I'll just, uh, you have a marker that I can use? Yes. So, so when you write a query, the first thing that happens is you build, you represent it as. Uh, as a logical, as a parse tree, you write some language, there's a parse tree. So basically, let's say there is a relation uh, RA and RB, okay? And you want to join them, right? So there is data that is going to flow from here and here, and the result is put forward and you apply a selection. Let's say it's a simple select project join here. Between two relations, okay. So this is RA, this RB. I'm joining them and I'm applying a selection here, and then I'm applying a projection. Now what is happening here? Data is flowing from these nodes and going up. That's a simple textbook here, query line from. I haven't actually pushed on the projection selection now, but they could be, okay. That's so. If you were to execute this, now this relation is sprayed on multiple machines. And so is this. It's not a single machine issue, right? So you have to, I would call this as a DAG, right? It's a, just a data flow diagram, OK? I would call this as a node because, uh, OK, so I, I would call this as a node. And because this is an operation that is happening on data that is coming from multiple inputs to it, so join and all. And so I would call this as a node and this as a node. Any operation that you do on data is captured inside a node, and all edges represent data flow between these operations. Okay, okay. So you build uh, this kind of uh, structure, uh, and then you replicate it. So each node is running this stack. Okay. Now what should happen is that you have this thing running. You will have data nodes and feeds from external sources, the web and whatever sources to receive data into the system. People are going to write queries in AQL, 
and get the results back. And then the rectangle over there in the rightmost corner says data publishing is basically you can subscribe to data because system is going to ingest and process data and keep doing that. And you can say that like Google alerts that I'm interested in this data, this pattern occurring over time and you can come back to me, system will notify you. But that's a uh, work in progress right now. Okay. Now, uh, let me now dive into the data model. Let's say you have to, you are working with tweets. Okay. So, uh, uh, here I represent how a tweet looks like in our data model. So, a tweet has, let's say, these five fields, an ID, a username, location, text, and hashtags. Okay. This is just like a create table statement in a database when you define the fields of a table. So, I'm uh, defining a tweet type. A couple of interesting things here. First of all, uh, the type is open, which basically means that every tweet in the system has these five fields, but could have more. Okay? In a database, by default, everything is closed, and that's the only option. Once you define a table, every record in the table has to have those fields. Okay? They may be null, but the fields are there. Right? I could also say it as closed, and that would mean that I'm mimicking a database. <coughs> But I've kept it as open for flexibility. So I'm giving you a norm that you can turn around from one end of the spectrum by saying that everything is closed to other end, which is basically flexible. And the more information that you give to the system, it's better able to store it and optimize it because it knows its fixed length of varying length, the each record. Now, on the right hand side, I have a representation of a news article, which is I'm creating a news type as open, I keep it open, and then I have the fields defined here. Now, uh, one thing to note is that location is a point which is a first class citizen because we are, as I emphasize on the ability to uh, process uh, spatial data, point is a first class citizen in a data type, just like string or int or something like that. Other thing to note is that there's some question marks here which basically mean that these guys could be not. Okay? And there are like uh, these. Uh, curly braces, double curly braces basically means that it's a bag of strings. So every tweet has hashtags, and so and every news article also has a bag of topics associated with it. So I've modeled how a tweet in real world I want to like how I want to capture that, and same I did for CNN news articles. Okay, so I'm just describing to the system how each data would look like. Now, once the system understands how data will look like, let me try to create a Twitter feed here. What I'm saying is that I want to store tweets, let's say, in the system. So I'm saying create data set, tweets, that's the name of the data set. Data set is just a table. Okay? When I say uh, I want to create a data set, I also mention the tweet type, basically saying that every record in this data set conforms with this type, which I described in the previous slide. Okay? I say partition by the key ID. So there's an ID field, is a type, and you hash partition it, and when you load the data, you've got multiple nodes in the storage layer, and you hash partition, and there you know where this particular record will land to and will be stored. Okay? But there's a difference here. I say a feed data set. And uh, if you remove this, it's basically an internal data set. Uh, a feed data set is a special one in the sense that it's going to be continuously ingesti uh, ingesting data from the outside world. If you create a normal data set, it's just that you can load data into it. But it's not active, it's passive. You have to have insert statements to put data into it. But when you do a feed data set, you have to use an adapter. An adapter is an entity that understands how I can get data to put into the system. It's something that is written specific for an outside service, you would write it for an RSS feed, you would write it for a Twitter feed, and it understands the protocol as to how to get data from the external service. Okay? So I don't have a Twitter adapter. It takes certain parameters. Uh, for example, interval, which is 10 seconds here, which means that every 10 seconds, I'm going to contact Twitter and get some data. Okay? And then, for every tweet that I gather from outside such aspects, I'm going to apply some function to it. Basically, uh, we are given this flexibility that 
you should be able to apply some UDF and do some complex processing like sentiment analysis on the fly from on the data that is coming and you can do data cleaning and all that. So you should be al allowed to specify what you need to do for every record that is about to enter your system. What I'm doing here is that I'm going to process the text of each week and collect words that start with hash because they're symbolic of topics in a week. Like people just use hash to refer to a topic. Similarly, I defined another feed, which is the CNN feed, and it uses a different adapter. And let's say I'm interested in the politics of it. So I'm going to say to CNN that whatever you have for politics, just keep this, I'm going to, I'm interested in that, and I'm going to, I'm, I will actually interact with you every 10 minutes. Okay? Because they don't change that often, so I have a leeway of uh, relaxing there. And then I apply a function get tab news on every news article and I extract the topics of every news article. So getting to each slide, getting news live, and getting the topics in each. And of course, like I'm going to partition that, that by key ID. Okay. Now I, I, I would also want to actually create a location index, which is an R3 based index. So basically, there are uh, a bunch of nice libraries that are written that people who studied NLP have done that. And they are taxonomy or uh, dictionary that help you. So basically, there's a UDF which is uh, written in some other language or quite some library, and you just invoke it. Asterisk can do the class loading and invoke anything that you want. Okay? Now, I want to actually create a location in this. In the, in the, uh, Basically, uh, when I talk to Twitter, its schema keeps changing. Right? Today, it's giving you some text and all that. Tomorrow, it will give you videos as well. Okay. So I kept it as open. Right? So it's not a free lunch. When I keep something as open, I'm going to pay a cost in the storage because it's not going to be optimized access. Random access is going to be costly because it has to read those feeds and figure out how many feeds are there in this record and jump to that option. So I was talking on a location index. So every tweet has a location to it, backlog. And I'm going to put that record in an R3 index. Okay. Now let me uh, now take you to the runtime as to what happens. What you're seeing here is a bunch of machines, uh, which I call asterisk nodes. Okay. And I have a Twitter service. I've already created create a feed data set. And I write begin feed and give name of data set. Now what this tells the system is to start ingestion of data. An adapter is instantiated on these nodes. So I've said that this thing is going to run on two nodes. Two nodes get the responsibility of just ingesting the data. Okay? And the raw tweets from Twitter service, which is a JSON model, are now being pulled into the system. Okay? What happens is that my system understands a specific data format, which is abstract data model format, ADM format. Okay? And the outside world is could be dealing in some property format. So you have to have a converter. So after this ingestion layer, there is this we get tweets in ADM format, which the system understands. Okay, now we are work, working in a single language now. Now what we do is that the middle layer here is the layer that applies the function. And the function could be very complex. If you do sentiment analysis, it's completely very expensive. So you got to actually scale out here and do it in parallel across multiple machines. 
maybe ingesting by just two nodes. But if you use the same nodes to even to invoke the function, you cannot cope up with a load, the rate of arrival. So you pass them, you basically do a load balancing. You have a bunch of machines in this layer, and this layer has to be elastic. Because if the rate of arrival goes down, then only one machine is enough to apply all the function to it. But if the rate is goes, goes very high in certain popular events, then you need more machines in the middle. So this has to uh, contract and expand as per the load of the system. Okay? And then once you have applied the function, right here, every one is embarrassingly parallel, and you basically apply the function parallel. And then remember that I wanted that the data has to be partitioned by a key ID, which is specified. So after I've done this uh, manipulation and uh, applying the function, I would hash partition it again and make sure that the data location is as per the definition. I will hash it on the ID, and based on that, I will put it to disk at a particular node where it's supposed to be. So this is a flow of data that was earlier owned by Twitter, but is now reaching asterisks. So that is a one third of what I'm going to talk about: data ingestion. Okay, and for uh, interacting with any other service like CNN or some other uh, kind of source, you just write this adapter. The rest of them is the same. Okay. Nasdaq comes with certain built-in adapters, uh, but you could write your own and just add it to it. Now, how do we manage it? Uh, feed. So now data keeps coming to you, right? It's live. So you could actually suspend the feed, which basically means that you will stall, and data will stop. We will stop pulling data. This could be done uh, to uh, make sure that like different uh, feeds are arriving at different rates, and maybe you want to stall somewhere, which is, and you want to save on resources. You you would like to stall a less important feed, something like that. So this is always an option to suspend it. You have a question? Oh, okay. You could resume it, of course, after suspension. And you could alter the feed on the fly. So if I was interacting with Twitter every 10 seconds, I could say now I want to, I'm going to track every 60 seconds. You could also alter other properties of the adapter. Like I was interested in politics for CNN, now it's in sports. So it will just change itself dynamically without you having to stop the system and restart things. And of course, you could end the feed and start again. Ending means that data stops coming to your system. And whatever data you've created so far is persisted, flush to your disk. And that is available for you. That is your data. You have indexed it. And you can write queries on top of it. OK? So now I'm going to work on, like, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, how do we, like, what things we need to make sure when we are processing uh, data? So I looked at certain recent tweets. Uh, about Anna Hazare, and uh, when you're working with web data, people won't write the correct spellings, right? So if I go to Twitter service right now and say I want to find out what people are saying about Anna Hazare, you would have to be uh, sure what the spelling is, and you're going to get only tweets that have that spelling. Okay? It doesn't have fuzzy search. So these are like three different spellings you see over here. And that's why data is like dirty over there, right? So you ha when you are interacting with web data, you have to have fuzzy search in it. Yeah. So what we have is that we're going to uh, we have a fuzzy of a select operator. I'm going to demo that later, which would say that I'm going to say that where I'm going to use the condition the fuzzy operator and use the word Amna Zare, but I'm going to provide an edit distance. You understand edit distance? It's like the smallest change that you need to do for one state to become equal to another. Okay? So if I say an edit distance of one, then these two will match. Okay? And so with this. With the one, with the one. So I'm going to specify this and say edit distance one and get me all tweets. <coughs> but you can please more if you have more dirt. But I'm going to make sure that I get everything what I'm looking for. Okay? Now that was selection, right? Let me uh, put forward a case for join, uh, similarity join. So let's say you want to optimize a web page layout. Okay. So my intuition is that articles about topics that are popular on Twitter are important. So if people are talking about a topic very frequently, and an article has been identified of that topic, 
then that article also becomes important. Okay. So what we do is that we've got CNN articles coming to our system, and we've got tweets coming to our system. So for every tweet, we have a topic, so we can keep an histogram. So what topics are important? And then for every CNN article, we also have topics. So there is the opportunity to have a fuzzy join between these two data streams. Where you're going to say that topics in CNN fuzzily joins with hashtags in the Twitter stream. And to find out which articles we need to show upfront as they are considered important. Okay. So fuzzy selection was previous, and this is fuzzy joining. So now I'm going to actually uh, I'm going showing you the actual syntax of the language that we have. Basically, I'm going to use Jacquard similarity. Uh, you're familiar with Jacquard similarity? It basically uh, defines that the similarity between two sets is uh, the, the ratio of the intersection of the two sets by the union of two sets. Okay? It's a common similarity function, but you could have your own. But what basically means that if the intersection is half of the union, something is these two sets are similar. Okay? So what I'm doing is that I'm, do, I'm iterating over a data set of tweets and a data set of news articles. And I say that where hashtags are similar to the topics, so if an article has five topics and a tweet has like six, seven topics, I've got these two sets of topics. So I do a join between these two, firstly, and find out that which articles do join, and then I basically group them with the article ID and <coughs> going to uh, look at the like the count of it and then basically uh, order it and decrease it, limit that, and I get a popularity count of every article that way. So for tweets that don't have hashtags, So for tweets that don't have hashtags, so remember that when we're ingesting uh, tweets, we had applied a function, add hashtags to tweets. That is a very weak function. But if you want to do some sophisticated analysis, there's a place for that. You have a sophisticated function that does actual analysis, not just string matching, but language based analysis to understand a topic. Okay? But uh, because uh, you're working in a system that already has this kind of uh, culture, you can leverage that and avoid expensive competitions. Okay? So let's say, so. Uh, now that we have done with uh, similarity uh, selection and joining, let's say you've seen data and you want to uh, understand where do you want to post your ads or something like that geographically. Okay. So now text was one dimension and location is another. Now I'm going to focus on location part. Okay. So basically, what we're doing is that let's say find all the tweets mentioning Romney. Okay, that's the presidential candidate. Posted between these dates inside the US. That's my predicate. Okay. So what I do is that <coughs> I would paint a grid structure over the map of US. Now every tweet that is entered in the system has a location, a point, which is basically a lat and long, and I place it inside the grid. And so every tweet contributes some grid. If it's based from the US, yes. Yeah, from where he is tweeting. Yeah, so basically, if he's mobile, then the cell would report its location. No, no, the actual physical. The physical. Yeah, if it's using a desktop, then IP would give a location. Right? So you're going to build a, this like an histogram only. Right? So, but this uh, is the structure is accessible using artery. So, I basically I can do some fast analysis in, through the artery index that I was building. And that basically I'm grouping them into subject keeping the counts. This is uh, what I was doing uh, here to paint this. Uh, what I'm doing is that I'm doing a spatial intersect, which basically means that I define a region. Okay, I define a resolution of each box inside a region, and then I apply this function spatial intersect, which basically say that given a tweet's location, dollar tweet dot location, and the region, 
whose resolution I've already defined. I would, I'm going to actually place it inside it, and then I'm also interested in. I, I defined the search hashtag wrongly. Okay, so let me start from the beginning and explain this what I'm doing. That's my data set tweets. For every tweet in the data set, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, search hashtag is wrongly. So I'm going to search for this guy wrongly there. So I have a point. Uh, these points are the left and right of the US. I define a resolution of three lat, three long. Okay. You create a rectangle. It's like uh, left bottom, right top. Okay. Now I have a predicate here that where the tweet's location is inside the region. Because I want to filter out every other tweet that is coming outside the rectangle. This condition helps me do that. Okay. And the time is between these and these, right? And there is some topic in the tweet, some hashtag in tweet which satisfies this condition. That the value of the search hashtag was defined above as Romney. There is some topic of the tweet which is wrong. And this could be fuzzy as well, but I've kept it as equal here. Once you're done that, so you till here you have got all tweets that have satisfied your predicates. Okay? Now I'm going to do grouping of those tweets. Because I want to group by the grid. It's a spatial grouping. So I say group by spatial cell, which is basically one cell, and I pass in the tweet location and the left bottom, right bottom, and the resolution. And this function, which is a built-in function in asterisk, returns you a particular cell. Every tweet maps to a cell, you group by the cell ID, and you maintain counts. And then you just paint it on the system, or, or, on the interface. So that's what I'm doing. Now, I'm, I'm coming towards uh, the end of the talk, but it's going to follow by a demo. But what are we right now having is that it's a parallel database system, uh, semi-structured, unstructured. You can just model uh, accordingly. It allows you large data scans, primary index lookups, even secondary index lookups. Joins are like regular as well as fuzzy. It allows you aggregation, and we have an operation like local aggregation at each node, and then a global aggregation. And then we have external data access that we can access data from outside world. We have similarity selection in joins uh, that are now efficient lab, spatial aggregation, and now we're currently moving to LSM based storage. That's the current state. Uh, we would like to thank. Uh, NSF grants that we received for this. So we started in 2009. It's been three and a half years. And that is what has kept us alive. Uh, you see this from the eBay. Uh, and some of the awards that uh, we have recently uh, backed in the last like, three, four years. So uh, what's next is that we want to make it open source. Uh, this whole system is like 50 kilonines of code. So it's a big system. Uh, in late 2012, like uh, fall, uh, we're going to make it open source under a party license, and you can always try this. Uh, we of course like talking to multiple people and trying to like uh, work them in installing them in their real setups. Uh, we have we already have the system uh, tried at Yahoo on our 200 node cluster there, uh, but we're seeking early partners, and you can always uh, ping me if you want to know more about the system. And of course, like uh, I'm going to give you a demo that it's going to actually really help you understand what we have built so far. OK? Uh, so let me switch gears here and uh, let me open up a browser. OK. So I'm going to start the system. So what I just uh, stripped to start an access system on my local, uh, like my laptop. I'm I'm having a uh, I'm simulating a three-node cluster where one is a master and two are slaves. All of them running at separate VMs on my laptop. Okay. Uh, that's our uh, web interface. 
Uh, nothing fancy about this, so no ads, nothing. And uh, we uh, just allow you to write, that's a big Google text box for us. That you write anything and you get data results back. And uh, I'm running on the local host, and I will write queries on here and submit and get the results. Okay? So let me first uh, describe what data I'm going to use. Uh, so, first of all, uh, a concept of a data was basically it's a namespace. So you, this is a multi-use system. Everyone creates their own tables and everything in their own dataverse. Okay. So I'm getting a dataverse demo, which is uh, just straightforward. And you just created a dataverse. Then I'm going to start loading data. So let's say. Okay, so I want to walk uh, through what I'm doing here. I've already created a dataverse demo, right? So I say use dataverse. So I'm using that dataverse now, inside a dataverse. I'm going to create a type, uh, address type, which represents just the address. It, uh, it has number, street, city. A customer which has a customer ID name, an age, and an address, and his last order. So note that uh, what type can have a complex type inside it? Like customer has address type inside it. And then you create a data set, customers, saying that every customer is this customer type. And then I'm going to load data. Uh, so data could be anywhere. Data could be uh, in HDFS or the local uh, file system. Or, so what you have here is you have adapters that know that some service uh, store is there. So our adapter works with understands how to load data from the local file system of any node. So uh, here, uh, every node is given an ID. I have two nodes that are my slaves, so it's NC1 and NC2. I give the path and say that the data there that is like this path is already in the ADM format. Just load it. Okay. I'm going to hit this. Now, right now, it's reading data. It's not that big, it's about I think it's a million records. Okay. I can actually show you the size. So it's seventy-four. Okay. It has loaded. Okay. So we loaded customers. So we have customers. Now I wrote something similar for loading order data. So we'll go back. Write something similar to what I wrote earlier. Take an order type. It's in the same dataverse. Then I'm going to get a data set orders and load data to it. This is the loading phase of it. This is uh, more data because the customer has like Every customer has more orders, like more and more orders. So it's going to take uh, some time. But this is uh, the initial loading part. And these are all like, uh, this, this is a normal data set. You create data set and you load data into it. This is not actively pulling data from the web. But I would show you that as well. So I got uh, the data done in this. And similarly, I'm going to work with another kind of data, which is DBNP data. So DBNP data contains all uh, data related to publication databases. So we're going to have an ID, a DBNP ID, a title, author, and some mysterious attribute. And we say create this data set and load it from here. Now, interesting part is that this data is actually delimited text, which has a delimiter colon. So I can specify that, and it will just make sure that it recognizes all the fields directly and put it in the right place. So let me hit submit here. You see, uh, you're using ADM uh, format because you uh, only have an adapter for that. Because we are using that adapter. Uh, we're using ADM format because our system understands only ADM format. Uh, in the sense, like, 
the sample which we have sample data that is already in the ADM form. Uh, this one is not. This one the format was JMT text. It's not ADM. No, it's previous one. Previous one was ADM. It happened to be ADM, but so that's coincidence. So we use the adapter which is written for that. Uh, an adapter has uh, two parts to it. One is where it is fetching data from. Local system or like an HDFS uh, live remotely. Okay? And it has a parser uh, functionality. That is, from where the data is coming, what is the format of the data? Whether it is delimited text or it's ADM or it's JSON or something else or XML. Okay? So an adapter understands both of them. Okay? So it, it has a parsing function and a fetching function. Right? So I'm using a local FS adapter because I'm, the data is in my local FS. But I can always tell the adapter that use this parcel. And how I tell is through parameters. That this kind of data that you want to get is delimited text and has this kind of delimiter. If I say format is ADM, uh, adapter knows that data is ADM, it doesn't need to do any conversion. Okay? So, uh, so this Let's, uh, yeah, once the data is loaded, everything will just run. Yeah. Okay, it's just a data loading that takes time, and these two are very small data sets. They won't take much time here. Uh, it's done. Okay, and this one more data set. This tweak data sets. Uh, this will take tweaks. Okay. Now, let me uh, write some interesting queries. Let's say uh, we're going to use uh, uh, So these are the basic queries that you can write. And here I'm trying to count the number of uh, stuff, uh, number of records in dataset orders. So when you create over it in a parallel count function, uh, I can create indexes. Like here I'm creating an age index and a name index of customers. Uh, I can do a join, which is Basically, between customer and orders on this predicate, I can uh, do some interesting stuff if I want to do fuzzy select. Okay, let me uh, run this and show you some results here. Let's say I change this. And I am Changing the spelling to be not, yeah, that's on purpose. Because I have specified the edit distance to be three. So I should get something that is of the right spelling. So I got this paper, which is here, and I could match it. Okay? So you could do a fuzzy join as well. Basically here, uh, this is also an interesting result. Let me show you this. What I'm doing is that I'm, I'm doing a self join over DBLP data and saying that trying to find out papers that are similar. So every paper has a title with a set of words. And if they are similar with each other, they're going to do a self join. Them. Let me just show you results here. So. Sorry? What is all the Oh, so basically, I'm, I'm printing everything. I have a logical plan here for the theory. I have the lo optimized logical plan. And then, that's the physical plan actually, which is huge because this is a complex thing. Uh, and this is uh, a job that is run. This is a Hyrex job, it's a DAG. It represents nodes and connection between them. So it has some connectors like this. And it has an operator which is a node. It's basically a human readable thought, so to say, representation. And let me just scroll down for results here. Yeah, so here are my results. So let's say query processing in multi database systems matched with query processing in object oriented database systems. Two papers that the system found to be very similar because of the kind of words in it. So that's a fuzzy, fuzziness. Okay. Now I could not connect to VPN, but what if if I had, then what I would, I could do is that 
basically there's a file that is there uh, on my advisor's machine which is uh, running an HDFS. I could point to this uh, file and basically create an external data set. It means that I'm going to pull data on demand. Not it's I don't own the data, but just for the temporary purpose, like creating a temporary variable, pull the data and do this processing. This is useful for cases when you just want to have like one off theory that you don't want to own the whole data for it. Okay. And now I'm going to uh, show you the, the, last, the last step here, which is uh, creating a feed. So let's say. Saying that I want, I'm interested in all tweets about IT Delhi, and I'm going to pass through every 10 seconds. Okay. Once I'm done that, I'm going to open this. Say I'm in this dataverse demo. Begin data injection. This never returns. Unless it is asked to. Okay? I can open another window, <coughs> say use the <coughs> demo, and say for dollar tweet, or let's say a simple variable n, n data set, because I'm collecting all of the data in the, this data set, right? So while I'm talking, system is putting data from Twitter. And we're going to see in a couple of minutes what we have collected about IT Delhi. But meanwhile, I'm open for questions. So, uh, one question I have is that you say that these functions that you're applying, they are completely parallelized. But this uh, deep parallelization is a problem, right? Because often the uh, functions that you talk about uh, uh, sentiment around this is really different. I mean, they cannot be done completely in parallel. There's a, the information content is not uh, it is shared amongst the different uh, data objects. Yes. So, if, so in that sense, that if I say that here's one record, you apply the function there. Here's one record, you apply the function there. Actually, uh, the parameters that the function needs to get something out of that data are, are being learned from the data as the data comes in. So in that situation, a uh, uh, completely parallel so, uh, setting is not the fact. Let me say this that. It's a, if you treat it as a machine learning problem, you would have a training data, and the function has already been subjected to the training data, and it's now trained to identify other new data and categorize it accordingly. That's right, but in an online setting, that's not the case, right? I mean, when it's coming in, as, as it comes in, it needs to be categorized. No, but if your, if your logic of categorization is only depending on the words contained in that, like let's say, how people do it, like at Walmart, what they're doing is that they have a predefined list of topics, 250 topics. That is what they have, and they don't need to look beyond that. They have a dictionary as well, so every tweet that they interact, uh, analyze, they don't need to look beyond anything. No, I, I see what you're saying, but the thing is that if your architecture is like this, then it will prevent people like us who work at that layer to uh, come up with situations where the task is being done online. I the see. function is being computed in an online way based on the data that has been seen so far, or based on because otherwise I'll need communication. Suppose uh, from the first 1,000, 1 million tweets, I learn the parameters and then I use that to, to classify right. the right. Main 1 million. That means I'll have to keep and my parameters. Uh, I'm getting I'm getting closer and closer to the actual value of the parameters the more data I see. So the, so I expect the classification task to be better at the end than it was at the beginning. So those parameters they have to be shared continuously yes. amongst everyone. Absolutely, and if in that setting, what I would do is that I would uh, we had a layer that does this, right? Mm -hmm. Let's keep the cardinality of that to one. Mm -hmm. Let it receive data 
on a single node for a certain period of time. Right? And once you are done with that, then you scale up. Because once you have actually formed something, some information, put it through some shared memory stop and then scale out this and then have them access them. That's how you could do this. That, that could be that would be potential bottleneck. Uh, yeah. I mean because you yourself want to analyze everything. Right. Right. It's the algorithm it's that is built like that. Okay. So let me now hit this. So it's still maybe there's not much of uh, data that is there about right now. So, <laughs> so uh, maybe uh, if you have one or two more questions, I'll wait. And if I get some more data, I, I can show you what people are talking about. Uh, so, uh, tweets are small. So, you got the entire tweet. Yeah. Uh, the text was there. For news articles, whereas you use the link. So, yeah. you go and crawl. You, uh, yeah. You, your UDF does that. Okay. You get the uh, web page and apply the library function and get the, get the copy. So that data is being fetched and stored in the system. Which which part data? The, the news article. So it the text of the big news article. So the way I uh, defined a news article, I did not show the big text, but I could because I'm already fetching it. Right. What I'm doing is I'm having an ID, a title, a description, a summary. And a and a bag of topics with it, right? But in theory, you could. So right now, oh, okay. So in that model, you're not uh, using the text, but you could use the text. I'm, and I'm using the text to populate the bag of topics, but I'm not storing the text further for any kind of processing, okay. because all I showed you was just uh, like the topics are sufficient for all analysis. But in theory, this space is cheap. You could always do that. So let me give a final attempt to this and see if we have something. Uh, not much right now, but it just depends like on, on the time and all that stuff. So uh, that brings me to the end of this uh, talk. And uh, if you uh, this want last search we it for the current weeks which are coming. Yeah. It has a small window. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every 10 seconds you try to fetch and if there's nothing that Twitter wants to return to you at this point. So it's just what you're getting Twitter. And if you if you want to actually connect with me, uh, yes. One more thing is that uh, uh, I am also sort of talking on behalf of the whole uh, group at UCI. And if you have questions regarding graduate studies at our place, I'm more than happy to answer anything uh, right now. Or you can always uh, reach me uh, uh, at my uh, sort of. You just Google me, and you'll find my web page and everything, and you get my email ID, and you can. Uh, bombard me with questions, a, anything that you want to learn about that place and how we are conducting research. But this is what we have been doing for the last three years, and that is what, and this continues to be, be the main focus for the next like, three years at least. Um, and my thesis uh, will be born out of this. Yes. You mentioned Yes. So, uh, this is the aim of this work for people writing everything. So first of all, we decided that we need one system to solve all the problems. So we need a norm that you can ship depending on the user needs. Like right now we see that there's people like Facebook. Facebook has a MySQL setup as uh, group setup and a lot of other stuff, right? And that can basically you are creating problems than solutions. <coughs> so you build one system that adapts accordingly, and people have put it into different uses as per their needs. So we allowed that because that's the whole covers the whole spectrum, okay? But of course, like if you are dealing with structured data, you create close types and you get more information, you gain optimization there. So these are something that you can't avoid. Like if you are playing with totally unstructured data, there is some cost in that you need to pay in accessing the such data, and that you pay. But the system allows you to do so. It's a single system that does that. So, uh, social news aggregator like say Google News or other social 
social media rules aggregators, they would be also doing something uh, similar. But uh, yes, they they they, they want, basically what they uh, they have a lot of uh, like uh, they have roughness as well as they they do back processing. Basically, they ingest uh, data, keep it as files on HDFS, and run map this job on it. Uh, they do a lot of machine learning, which is express as map reduce, and run as offline jobs. What I'm showing you here is online activity. Like on the fly, you are ingesting and doing some computation and putting into this. And then you would have continuous queries running on top of the stored data sets to continuously run something and paint some dashboards out of it. Wouldn't the live processing be done by Google also because it gives So you could construct a similar dashboard from this as well. Because the requirement is the same. It, you have to pull data from different sources, it's text, it's location, it needs fuzzy search, everything. So you sort of uh, have the same machine key. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. 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 Yes, th